Hey, Scott Hammond, 100% Humboldt with my uh, new best friend, Leonard LaFrance. How's it going? It's going. How's EPT? Uh, busy. Very busy. You guys are always always busy, and we're big fans uh, at State Farm. My office is downtown, and you guys are always amazing. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Leonard. How did you get here? You said upstate New York? Sure. Yeah, I was uh, born in New Hampshire. Uh, barely made the uh, made the seventies by about ten months, uh, and uh, I think around five when I was five or six, we moved from uh, New Hampshire, uh, Nashua, <laughs> which is uh, it's about forty five minutes north of Boston. Uh, so it's kind of almost a suburb of Boston. It's over the border, right? So, yeah, it's just over the border. Um, so you can go to New Hampshire and you know you do your shopping, and it's there's no no taxes. Um, oh, nice, like Oregon, kind of like Oregon, yeah. <laughs> so we uh, ended up in uh, northern New York, uh, about two and a half three hours north of Albany. And just south of Montreal, Quebec. Wow. Um, and I lived there for, what, uh, to about 97. But in the meanwhile, you know, I was, I went to a, a private boarding school. Uh, I was not wealthy, but wow. our church uh, sent me to a, uh, by choice, to a, a boarding school. Wow. In a little place called Union Springs. Um, Way upstate? Uh, it was actually, it was actually south from where I, where I was growing up on, uh, next, just west of Syracuse okay. on Lake Cayuga and spent four years there and, I uh, went to college in Nebraska. Uh, I had to, wow. did my for my first degree is I had an associates in fire science. I was going to be a firefighter. Okay, uh, as my father and grandfather and other grandfather and my cousins and family. And then uh, 2000, I graduated and I was offered a job with the U.S. Forest Service uh, out of Mad River on Highway 36. Wow! And then about six months later, I was given a, a permanent seasonal job with them. Huh. And uh, yeah, in 2000, so I ended up here about 20, yeah, 23 years ago. From fire to police. Fire to police. Yep. Wow. Okay. What part of Nebraska? Uh, Lincoln. So. So what to you? You have in? No, I went to uh, Southeast Community College, and okay. then I also went to Union College, which is a, a, a private college in Lincoln. So Lincoln's a cool town. Uh, it's a college town. Lincoln is a cool town. If you're in your twenties, that's the that's the place yeah. to be. We're from Sioux City, Iowa, so we're yeah. upriver a little ways. So yeah, Midwest people are always solid. Very, yeah, it's a good, it's a, I love Link, living in Lincoln. So yeah, hey, all you Midwest people, you're solid. Yeah, they are so, solid. Shout out to the Midwest. So. So that's what brought you here. Did you meet your, are you family guy? I assume you. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, in the mean, when I came to California, I actually left uh, for a couple of years, went back to Vermont. Actually, mm-hmm. I was with the U.S. Forest Service. I got a, a transfer to, as I actually ran a fire engine in Vermont for a couple of years. I wow. uh, met my wife. And then once in 2005, I'm like, I'm going back to California. Uh, fire seasons are pretty slow on the East Coast. Yes, they and are. Well, not right now. Not right now. No. Uh, yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's in Canada, right? Aren't yeah, the fires in, in Canada? I actually fought fire in Canada in 2005. It was interesting in Quebec. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, I met my wife. I uh, came back out here to my, actually my old job with the Six Rivers National Forest as a squad leader on the what's now the Mad River Hot Shots. And then uh, hmm. she came out and about a year or two later, I was saw an opening for EPD and uh, applied. And I think there's about 125 applicants and about two of us, I think two of us had 125 made it. Through wow. the whole process. So, what drew you to law enforcement from fire? Uh, I think personality. Um, it's much much more of a fitting personality for me. Sure. Uh, plus, with the Forest Service, it was great. You know, you fought a lot of fires, but you're also gone for six months of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, the pay wasn't phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lot of fun. You traveled a lot, but um, when you're gone for six months of the year, um, it just needed some stability. Mm-hmm. Seems like you're a personal guy. So, we're going to talk about what you do here in a minute. Um, uh, what do you do here in a minute? What, what's your what's your role at EPD? Yeah, so uh, I'm a police commander, so which means that uh, I I oversee half the department. So I oversee investigations and special teams uh, mm-hmm. and property. So uh, so any kind of major crime, um, technically, I'd be the commander. I have a, I have a sergeant who works uh, under underneath me mm-hmm. or works with me, and then he has his team. Uh, we have our community safety engagement team, which is our our mental health homeless outreach. Uh, crisis intervention team mm-hmm. um, that I actually helped start back in 2018 when I was a sergeant. Is that uh, Officer Swanlin? Uh, Swanson. Yep. Swanson. Yep. Great guy. Yep. He was the missed officer for, uh, with uh, that team for a while. Um, so I was that team, uh, property, and a bunch of other positions. Um, and then the other side of the house would be the patrol house, okay. which right now is Commander Hill. And we'll be Commander Rebang here momentarily. Wow. Yeah, I saw uh, Ryan in action. He's great. Just, yeah. Just talking to people. Just having a conversation. Yeah, that's really what you know with that uh that mental health team that's really what we we do. We build rapport. Uh we you know meet people where they're at. We go upstream, we try to connect with people. Mm-hmm. This way when they go into full on crisis, we're able to de-escalate them really quickly or yeah. they comply. I love um it. but nowadays most of the time I I either go to I'm in meetings or um oh. uh which is fine cuz that's you know that's 
that's how you're helping with create policy and creating uh, streamlining services and creating influence to really move programs forward sure. that need to need to happen. And um, so I'm always meeting interesting people and trying to make things or try to fix problems and trying to make things better. Good. That's a good way to look at it as opposed to it's another Zoom call. <laughs> I'm on the half hour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that seems like that goes that way a lot. So, well, cool. Uh, so Tell me a little bit more about you and Kim Smalley at the Regional Center and how you inter- interact with uh, uh, Regional Center here. Uh, it's actually Regional Center number one in California. That's their designation. Yeah, it's kind of it meant to be. Um, it's it's kind of a unique scenario. Uh, you know, we we within CSET obviously we work with people that are in crisis, people that have disabilities. Um, I teach classes on de-escalation. And CSET is again what? Uh, community Safety Engagement Team. Okay. So when I was with that team, you know, we we're heavily involved and work with people uh, in that realm as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I didn't know is that my, my personal world would also become engaged with that world as well. Ah. And so when my son was diagnosed with autism. Um, so uh, so here I am in my professional world, my personal world to kind of collide together. And it happens. Yeah. It, it happens. And uh, so it just kind of worked out well that we, uh, you know, started teaching classes together. Uh, I met her with the, during the crisis intervention training we have every year, mm-hmm. uh, which is a 40 hour class uh, led by law enforcement and the county uh, behavioral health. Mm-hmm. And we were teaching a class on uh, autism and law enforcement engagement. Uh, we did that a couple times um, and some other classes, I think, also. And eventually she asked me last year if I can go down to Sacramento or to Ukiah. Wow. And they had a they had a two day seminar um, for law enforcement. Uh, and so they asked me to be one of the one of the key speakers or person that was there from the law enforcement side to help uh, teach uh, how how to best engage people on the spectrum uh, for law enforcement. The people on the spectrum are everywhere. It's the spectrum. It's a way like my son. You, if you met my son, you'd you would think he's a normal kid, right. um, a normal nine year old. And then once you hang yeah. out a little bit enough with them, obviously have some social and communication deficits. You'd know, um, yeah. But otherwise you you would never know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. No, I understand the so so you're so we have Gabriel. He's 23. He's got autism and Down syndrome, and he's. Uh, He's he's my hero. Gabriel's always in in happy land, and so I get it. Uh, so your role then is to take your knowledge, your experience, your expertise with folks with autism and on the spectrum, and go inform other 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 teams and other individuals about how 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 to deal with that best on the streets. Yeah, especially specifically with with law enforcement. So mm-hmm. obviously there's lots of uh, you know mis- misunderstandings about autism or if you see you know an individual stimming, uh, of course you know officer could think they're under the influence which is not true. Right. Um, so how do we you know, how do we approach that? How do we slow things down? How do we look for signs mm-hmm. and symptoms of autism? Um, how do we appropriately engage somebody? Um, how do we you know just sitting do you sit close do you, you know do you you know do you, you know, there's no, usually the rule space. for us is there's no space, there's no touching <clears throat> unless it's absolutely necessary. Right. Um, unless you're a fireman, then if there's a fire, obviously that's the one rule that you can touch them. Dr. If, Smalley has is you can grab them and go. Yeah. Um, but our rule for police is unless absolutely necessary, we don't touch um, sure. at all because it can create a major, major issue. Um, and the, the really the goal for us as we look at it is when we engage these, these our, our community members that have autism mm-hmm. um, that, you know, there are in the, our community. We're making sure our, our response is appropriate, um, but also we're limiting the possibility of a misunderstanding that leads to use of force. Sure. And there's videos. I think you can go on YouTube and find videos of tons of stuff of stuff with law enforcement and misunderstandings or just bad uh, bad approaches or right stuff that didn't need to happen. Stuff that I think that we can you know sometimes you can't change everything, but there, you can look <clears> back and say, hey, for sure this this should have been different. Mm-hmm. And then how do we how do we help people and show them a better way? So. In your experience, there are a lot of people on the streets, say in Humboldt, all over, that were, are on the spectrum that are just somehow, whether they're homeless or not, but they're on the street and they're maybe late late at night or in a weird spot. Is that is that common to have somebody on the spectrum hanging out? Uh, I don't think that common. Um, mm-hmm. Although I just pulled the current data because I'm teaching a class, I think, next week with uh, Jacob Rosen, our clinician for the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, uh, the numbers now in California, one in 22 people in California have been, uh, have autism. Wow. That's the, the data. And then, of course, uh, boys are four times more likely than girls to have autism. I'm looking around the room here, I'm going, oh, that's got to be one of us. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, you know, and the nationally, it's one in 36 um, people nationally wow. uh, based on the on the research. Um so we don't. I don't think like our homeless community, which we work with. Um, I'm sure some of the folks we know have autism. Sure. Um, but most of the time, you know, the folks that we're going to engage with are likely kids that are 
uh, at school mm-hmm. or they're having you – know, there's an issue, there's a behavior issue or they're eloping. Um, okay. That's often – because uh, also underneath my division is also our school resource officers. And you so a lot, a lot of kids. Uh, yeah. Ki- yeah. Like like non-adults. Uh, most I think mostly. I mean we do obviously engage with adults as well, but mm-hmm. it seems currently a lot of the kids – or a lot of the f- people on the spectrum <laughs> we're dealing with are going to be, you know, adolescents. Wow. So eloping, problematic at home, whatever. Yeah. Wow. And good, then adults, occasionally adults, you know, we'll have calls from uh, places like Changing Tides or these service providers. Mm-hmm. They'll actually ask us to come out to the to the residence where the person's living, actually meet with them, mm-hmm. um, you know, get to know them a little bit, build rapport. So when they do go into a meltdown or a crisis mode, when we show up, they're like, hey, how's it going, LaFrance? Hey, what's up? And yeah. I'm like, hey, and I, plus I know, you know, hey, this is what's soothing to them. This is how mm-hmm. they, you know, this is how, uh, this is what we can do to actually make it better, not right. worse. Right. I bought, yeah. I brought my guitar. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that wouldn't actually, if, if I played guitar, that wouldn't, that would be an option. Yeah. Um, you know, it's because cool. there's nothing off the table when someone's in crisis, um, as long as it's moral, ethical, within pulse in the, in the law, uh, yeah. we're going to try it because what are the outcomes we want is everyone to go home like and it. people to get better. So I like it. I like the positive approach there. So um, as you look at Humboldt, um, I want to ask you about your top three. Uh, what do you see the top three challenges are in terms of uh, crime enforcement, crime prevention? Um, what, what, do, what do you see? Personally, is your 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 three Goliaths that you're fighting? I think it kind of all rolls into they're all they're all correlated. So I think the biggest thing is obviously homelessness. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the biggest complaint we have. Sure. Uh, and I would agree if you drive down Broadway or Fourth and Fifth, you just see it's in your face. You see it. Yeah. Um, but again, correlated with that is also mental health or mental illness, and then also substance use. And if we had to add a fourth, um, as we're as we peel back, I always call it peeling back the onion. Mm-hmm. Um, the core is going to be childhood trauma, and mm-hmm. you know we look at our ACEs scores for. Uh, adverse childhood experiences for Humboldt County. Uh, last I knew, we had 30% of our population has a score of four or higher. And the four or higher is the trigger point for negative impacts to physical health, Crazy. mental health. And so that's it's almost a third. Yeah, almost a third. A third yeah. Four or We'd have a four oh or higher. And then, and then a one or higher is, I can't remember the percent, but um, we haven't seen the, I haven't seen the most recent data on it, but we're still not sitting good. Hmm. And I'm not sure being an outsider coming into Humboldt, uh, even an outsider into California, the West Coast. You know, I wonder, there's obviously some value difference between like the East Coast and West Coast, sure. where West Coast is uh, is definitely a lot more progressive. It's definitely just a different, not as, definitely not as conservative as the East Coast, even R- though they share maybe some. Maybe rigid, is that a good word? Rigid is maybe a better word, because it's not really political. It's just how For, we. Formal. It's how we approach the world. Yeah. And so I'm not sure how that works with, a, you know, with values within the system. And then Humboldt, of course, we look, you know, if we could define the values here. Um, you know, I think in many regards, we're seeing high crime rates for 136,000 people. It's not a lot of people. Right. And yet we see, you know, you know, look at the homicides, look at the missing people. Sure. Um, and it's yeah. just, it's just, it's very interesting to me to, you know, can you define it? I don't, I don't know, but. Can you attribute that? And, and this may not be a popular question, but it, it's an honest question uh, to the cannabis industry and it's, it's influence over 50 years here. I, to a be, be, again, being an outsider. The industry in, and the, the whole yeah, I, th- I think from from my opinion, looking from the outside, looking in from an out, being again not living here, or, you know, not originally coming from here, but mm-hmm. looking inside, I think the the values again, you know, what are the values in mm-hmm. in that you know, I guess microculture of our community, you know, it's money, it's wealth, it's mm-hmm. having big trucks, it's making as much as you can, it's not sure. following the rules, it's hiring people and then disposing of them, um, mm-hmm. it's you know part you know hum- there's human trafficking involved in that as well. Sure. And so I think that's part of it um, that, you know, that, you know, we, you know, for a long time, weed's just normal. You meet most kids nowadays here in Humboldt, mm-hmm. you know, they're smoking weed by 12. It's a normal thing to do. Right. Where for me, um, I've actually never used cannabis ever. Yeah. I've never had a desire to. Um, Good for you. You know, and if, if as an adult, it's legal. If you want to use it, hallelujah to you. Mm-hmm. Go, go for it. But I think just the, the, you know, the, it appears that the value system with that is just, it kind of throws everything mm-hmm. out of whack a little bit compared to the rest yeah. of the nation. You know, Sheriff Downey uh, told me 25 years ago we were camping. He was homeschooled dad, and we were in a thing. But he said, you know, he was Sheriff down in Miranda in Southern Humboldt. He goes, it just the value system is different generationally already. Kids don't, you know, they've learned that money is not that valuable, and they're just, and so it escalates into other drugs and other pleasures and weirdness. And it's like, he goes, it, it is really weird. It, it is a whole different, different deal. And I think, um, I don't want to go too far off on those guys. Or it's sad. It, it to me, it's a sadness. And the, I, I am going to rant for a minute. My rant is that some of those guys kill the environment. And so, all you f- environmental friends, these guys are 
you know, torturing the environment. And, you know, I, I remember he said he could, there's 7,000 grows. He could, he could attack about 70 of them if he gets lucky this year. And I go, wow, that's a big job. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of it is the value, what's the value, the sanctity of life. And that's where, you know, if you can view other people that will come to your property and you'll just dispose of them when you're done, like we've seen before with a couple of homicides. Yeah. Um, it's just a different way of living. Yeah. And that's and it, and it murder, the murder mountain stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it just doesn't match the values of what I, I see as, you know, everyone has value no matter, you know, you know, I, we look at a lot of our folks on the streets sure. and of course people say they have no value, but they do. It may take They're human beings, man. It may take a while to push back the behavior and see that value and that spark of life, but mm -hmm. it's there. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just my, that's how I view the world though. And so I don't, I just think the value system is a little bit off sometimes. Weird. Um, yeah. I've heard a term Imago Dei, which is image of God. So, hey man, um, I could have been a homeless guy. Yeah. Instead I got nine kids. So yeah. sometimes I wonder which is better. No, I'm kidding. So, uh, no, I appreciate that. And, and to me, in all fairness to the growers of grow industry, there's a ton of amazing, beautiful people mm -hmm. that are doing it right, that do, want to do it right and want to make it a good thing for everybody and make it a win-win. And uh, it's sad that there's that abuse and moving on to, uh, so, so the top four problems then kind of all in your mind coalesce. They do. And play on one another. So what, what, um, how do you propose to fix all that? Because I, I realize that law enforcement is supposed to fix all our problems, which is, I'm being facetious completely, but what, um, what are you guys doing? Uh, and, and I mean the autism program too, but what are you, what are you guys doing to really make a dent in that? Cause I think it's up to all of us to, to dent it and try to make it better. Yeah, that's the great question, right? Uh, and I've been, you know, of course from 2018 to <laughs> up to the last end of last year, I was obviously running, running CSET uh, as a supervisor. And I mean, very, very much, that was my life for five years mm -hmm. and still a big portion of my life now, What you know, working with the department. Um, but the solutions are one, uh, what, what, what can we do? What's mm -hmm. in our control? So one is the human connections we make every day with the folks on the street. So right, yeah. we know them by name. Uh, you know, we know where they stay. We know that we connect with their families if we need to. We try to find out the underlying cause of why they're on the street. Is mm -hmm. it substance use? Is it mental health? Uh, what? How can we fix that and actually address that? Um, but it all starts with the human connection. So if you if you see me walking down the street, they're like, hey, hey, La France. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the conversation we have, and it's a wave. It's a it's a hello every day. Mm -hmm. um, but that also leads into like you know accountability and voluntary compliance and and unwanted behavior. Uh, so I think the personal connections is the number one most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to be where people are at. So you can't sit in your office all day and expect people to come to you. Right. Um, as social workers, and we're not social workers, but we do a lot of social work. Yes, you do. You yeah. have to, you have to go where people are. Mm -hmm. So you have to go out into the field. You have to go down to the service centers. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to connect with people there and, and connect with the staff and become very good friends with them as well because they're good people mm -hmm. and they can help people. And then also learn how to work the system here. Um, so how do we get people from into a rehab center? So we have connections with, you know, Waterfront mm -hmm. Recovery, HRC Crossroads. Uh, so who do I call when I have an issue? Mm -hmm. and, I, and immediately can streamline that person. Into, so you know who these guys are. Yep. And, so, you know, same thing with mental health. Um, if we have an issue with mental health, how can we streamline that person? Or mm -hmm. if the system's not working for us, how do we backdoor the system? So, for example, we've had folks that had hundreds of calls for service a year on them. A lot of it was mental health with drugs. But, of course, whenever there's the co-occurring, which is very common, uh, but if it's so heavy on the drug side, people are un often unwilling to help them. Sure. And so if they can't, then we would, in theory, um, we will look at the, what can we legally do as officers to mm -hmm. address the problem. So we start making arrests, which we can lawfully do. It's in our, it's in our purview. Sure. It's, it's, it's right. It's lawful. It's moral, ethical, within policy, within the law. Uh, and then we work through the court system, say, hey, DA's office, we have Bob here. Bob's causing a lot of problems. Bob mm -hmm. has an addiction issue with methamphetamine or whatever. Mm -hmm. He likely has a mental health disorder. Um, hey, public defender, same thing. Let's work together on this to get a long-term solution. Wow. Whether it's either going to rehab or you know sobering up for jail in six months, then going to rehab mm -hmm. or be, uh, getting conserved, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, we have to look at those options because their their impact is so negative that we have to do something. Sure, sure. I remember uh, everybody used to accuse Pelican Bay or Bay Area, you know, law enforcement shipping their guys up here. And uh, is that true? Did they ever, one way ticket, you know, Greyhound to, to Eureka, bro, 
Yeah, I know from Pelican Bay, people can be discharged here on parole. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have we've heard rumors of an influx of people coming from the, from Southern California <laughs> here mm-hmm. has not been confirmed yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that back in I can't remember many years ago it was it was someone sending people to Oakland or Oakland to somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But then they, there's a lawsuit. It's like four hundred thousand dollars per person. Wow. Um, so for example, we can if we meet someone on the street and they want to go back home to family. Example: We had a gentleman in North Dakota mm-hmm. that wanted to go back to his family. Um, and so we met with him. He had pending charges on him also wow. for like a misdemeanor. Wow. So we, our staff, we have professional staff with CSET. They, they contacted the uh, family directly in North Dakota, said, hey, we have your, we have your, your brother here. He wants to go back home with you. Wow. Um, are you guys willing to take him? Yes or no? Well, yeah. they said yes. So we're like, cool. Then we have to get buy-in from him also to go. Mm-hmm. And then we also, we have, a, we have an issue with the court. So we say, hey, hey, DA's office, he has a pending misdemeanor. It's a minor charge. Uh, can it, if we get him to go back home, can we dismiss it? And then we'll talk to the victim of the crime and say, wow. hey, here's the plan. Instead of going to court and going the whole process, he actually wants to go back home to, you know, cross country. Yeah. Um, are you willing to, you know, are you okay if we just, if we choose not to prosecute this? Mm-hmm. Uh, usually people say absolutely. Um, yeah. And so like that gentleman, he was causing, I think, at least 100 calls for service a year. But we called back to the family. We confirmed their address. We confirmed we had a place to stay. We do all this, all this important work to make sure we're not mm-hmm. just dumping him. And then once we confirm, you know, go through steps through A through Z, we actually um, sent, you know, send him on his way either wow. by by bus or uh, usually by bus. But we could fly people out if we had to. Wow, bless you guys. Yeah, it's amazing. But it has. We just we're, we're just not dropping people. We're doing all the work to make sure they're actually we're way more way more behind it. I mean, we actually even Google the addresses to make sure there's actually a house there. Huh. So. Um, <laughs> And same with rehab centers. So if we fly people off of rehab centers, mm-hmm. we connect the dots. We talk to the rehab folks, say, hey, you know, Bob is going to be there. At, you know, his, mm-hmm. his plane lands at 3 o'clock. And then, of course, they pick him up. They call us, say, hey, he got here. We have him. Nice. So Nice. So Simper Virons is pretty small, right? Very yeah, few beds. About, I think it's, I think it's. don't quote me on this, it's, I think it's 15 or 16 beds on SV. For three, and, three counties? Uh, yeah, technically. I wow. think, yeah, Del Norte has nothing, and then Mendocino has nothing. There's actually not many mental health hospitals in California anymore. Wow. But they have some beds and they, they take some of the harder cases. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on, you know, it depends. Um, cause uh, you know, often right now all mental health holes go through the ER, mm-hmm. which has been obviously challenging. Um, and we, oh, yeah. work, and we work with St. Joe's closely, uh, their ER staff, their admin very closely on, mm-hmm. I don't know, we're, they're practically our, they're ext- our, our extended family. Yeah. Um, but they go to the ER first and then they get either sent out of the area or they get sent locally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but there's not enough beds across the nation. There's not enough beds. Yeah. Really issue close to my heart. I have a 21 year old who was suicidal at 15. Yeah. And he got a 5150 and, you know, day at St. Joe's and then eight days at the um, John Muir Hospital. Yeah. And wherever that is. And yeah, hard, hard story, but got to meet Ryan and different people. Yeah. And so interface with the, with the team a little bit. Yeah, and ev- you know, eventually the you know, na- state wise, we have to look at you know, how are we going to fund you know, better programs, more mental health hospitals. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they're going to change the laws a little bit for for gravely disabled for fifty one fifty to include SUD or substance use disorder as well mm-hmm. to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you you get people on the street, you get them stabilized, and where do they go after that? Where do they and, go? And so that's the you know, that's what we've been working on for the city is uh, some tra- transitional housing. So we'll have the project on Hillfaker coming up. We're looking at another project. Oh. Um, that is, you know, it's staffed. It's not just like, hey, just go live here. High five. We did an awesome job. It's no, right. like, here's a place to live. We're going to support you. We're going to give you case management. We're going to give you SUD support, wow. mental health support, employment support. This way you bring people back into the fold, not just say, hey, you know, we solved the problem. High five. We move on. Complex problem. But we have to bring them back into the fold and teach them how to live again. Right. And how to live, you know, how to live even in housing. If you've been homeless for, you know, 25 years, you may not have used a toilet and, you know, or cooked. You know, and yeah. so. Pay rent? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so plus if you have ongoing mental health issues or you know substance use issues, you also have to address those as well. So it's sure. some people think you know it's easy as giving someone a house and then you know it's, we're done, but it's much, much, much <sighs> more complex than that. Really tough, really tough. So how does how do you guys interface with say CHP or the sheriff's department or even other law enforcement? Do you, as EPD, I mean, what does that look like day to day or uh, paperwork or when you you know, when you're on a case like the the sheriffs that shot the two guys, I, you guys were probably back up on that. But how does that all work? Uh, it, it really de- it, it depends. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like the, in that instance, you know, we it happened in the city. So actually, I heard the call come out um, on the radio. Uh, you know, dispatch advisor shots fired. So I immediately I was actually at fourth and I think fourth and V is code three that way. And then so everybody just converges. Converges, yeah. And so you know, we you know, luckily there's the chief was there, the assistant chief was there, um, I was there, Commander Hill was there. 
And so, in, in essence, we set up a, a command or unified command with with the sheriff's is that office. County or is that sheriff's? Sheriff. That's, okay. That'd be our jurisdiction here. Oh, it was okay. It was in our city, in the city. Yeah. But they were on site first. Yeah. Well, they were. Yeah, they were involved in the incident inside the city. Gotcha. Uh, but you know, they, you know, the sheriff's office back us backs us on calls. If we don't have people to go to a certain like a in progress call, we can call the sheriff's office. Mm-hmm. Um, if we have you know collisions. Uh, you know, CHP has arrived to help out before, um, you know, for mm-hmm. us, for like with our criminal investigations unit or CIU, mm-hmm. uh, we've worked with, with Fortuna has, Fortuna has been awesome to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, they assisted us with, uh, several, uh, investigations here in, in Eureka that rolled over into Fortuna as well, mm-hmm. uh, for the officer involved shooting. Uh, you know, they were providing, uh, everybody from, uh, of course the sheriff's office, uh, CHP, sure. Uh, Pelican Bay, uh, Ferndale, Fortuna, all help with coverage at the hospital wow. when we had the two suspects. Um, okay. So it's it's really, you know, if someone needs help, they call us, and then, you know, we look at it, and we usually assist them. Uh, if we can, they assist us as well. So it's a small community. Uh, we, all have to, we all have to play together because it's a, it's a small swimming pool. Mm-hmm. So. Does that go for feds too? Do they, I mean, I imagine feds don't show up every day in Humboldt, but... Yeah, so there, uh, there's a, a couple agents down in, in down in Fortuna. They do uh, meet with not every week, but they meet with us uh, with our criminal investigations unit. Mm-hmm. Um, probably every couple of weeks, they meet with them. And there's there's some overlapping cases they work on, so we do see them. Gotcha. So how do um, how do we help? How does how does Joe Citizen, Josephine Citizen, jump in and I don't know help the team? You know, I think looking at a bigger picture from, uh, you know, what's what's causing the issues we have in in, in Eureka. Um, obviously, we have a high cr- property crime rate. I, I don't know. I haven't looked, pulled the data recently, um, but we are we are fairly high. Uh, but we have to look at, you know, kids. We have to look at how do we how do we go way upstream with kids. the youth nowadays? How do we reduce that trauma to the kids? Uh, how do we help um, develop programs that kids can have a positive experience, mm-hmm. even if they have a, you know, at home, they have a rough life. Mm-hmm. Um, but they show with ACEs, if you have one supportive adult in your life, the chance of you having positive outcomes is, is greatly heightened. Mm. And so, you know, we want that involvement from our, from our adults uh, in our community, you know, working with kids, mm-hmm. being a good example of what an adult looks like. Big brothers, um, big sisters. Yeah. For an example, I'm with uh, Humboldt IPA, uh, which is not a beer. Um, right, right. It's a, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm actually part of the Boys to Men mentoring group. I think it's called Men Empower right now, but it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a group for, we have uh, mentors come into different schools across Humboldt County. I've been with them since the beginning, um, hmm. and we just talk to, you know, kids that some kids have, you know, t- some have, you know, some troubles, things going on, but we just have conversations. I go in there for different schools, usually once a month. Oh. Uh, I've been to Juvenile Hall, very different places, but have very honest conversation with kids. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much say, hey, it's who I am. And I usually wear a suit or not my uniform. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, what do you think I do? And so I challenge them. Hmm. And, they, you know, start throwing things at me, you know, it's like, okay, you know, okay, I'm a cop. Okay, what, but what do I do as a cop? And, then, of course, they give me, you know, you know, you, the standard response, you know, you shoot people, you know, blah, blah, blah. 20 questions. Uh, 20 questions, you know. But then, of course, you know, once I, I like say, it. you know, what I do actually is I work with, <laughs> well, one, now I go to meetings. But, you know, mm-hmm. in the past, you know, I work with the homeless people and people mm-hmm. in crisis. And then, of course, that hope is a whole different dialogue. And they can, they can just shotgun questions at me. I don't care. I'll, I'll pretty much answer any question I can for them. But you're building that rapport with the kids. Um, you're That's having cool. honest conversations. And you're showing you're humanizing um, also officers on the same time. So what I'm hearing you say is connection with people relationship, connection, maybe deep connection, you know, for that kid you're going to mentor or, or uh, you know, there, there's a homeless guy in our alley who um, uh, he's really respectful. I really like the guy. And I, I was making a point to say hi and, you know, keep keep an eye on my place for me, you know, and he's, you know, he's a person, turns yeah. out. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, connection is key in anything, um, and I, it's funny because I'm actually I'm actually a pretty strong introvert. I guess mm-hmm. I'm a moderate introvert. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the most part, I you know I, when I go home, I you know leave me alone, get off my lawn. <laughs> um, but then I tap into my extroversion at work. Right. Um, but I still know that human connection is essential for all that we do. Um, but still, even with human connection, we have you know we build those rapport, but we also hold people accountable for the you know we have to have that balance. That's right. And so I, part of mentoring, you know, is you know yeah you know, let's have that connection, but there's rules in life and there's accountability. It's good. And to, you know, to grow up, to be a man in society, um, you have to, you know, you have to have accountability. Yeah. You have to, you know, you ra- if you raise a family, you take care of your family. Uh, That's if, right. if you're an adult, you get employed, you, you know, you work, you try to improve your life. You try to improve the lives of others. You mm-hmm. har- don't harm anybody else. And those simple things that, good. You know, that we've been blessed to learn. Um, but many kids that we meet nowadays, that's just, it's, it's not no common to them. Yeah. yeah. Accountability to what? Yeah. What's, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, no, I like that. I like that because that's, 
that is kind of the counterbalance to co- connection and community is accountability because we we're going to play in the sandbox. We're going to do it right. We're going to you know make mistakes and co- and come back and correct those and be accountable and move forward and grow and maybe that's what community is about. Um, so what motivates what motivates you? Uh, Leonard, in terms of what you do day to day, what what do you, how do you keep going? What's your secret? What's your mojo? What's your secret sauce? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm always been a very, very driven, intense person, uh, especially in, in adulthood. Uh, when I, you know, when I have a mission, um, like when I was, you know, any anything I'm doing, you know, at work or especially in work, um, it's that self pride I have to do the job right. And mm-hmm. then, you know, what is history going to say about me when I'm done, when I'm long wow. gone? Legacy. I think it's important. You know, it's you know, not that I'm saying I'm going to save the world because I'm not. Yeah. Um, you know, but if you save one kid or one adult, did your job. Then that's did, you did your job. But you know, I think it's that self pride that drives me to go forward, to yeah. to be the best I can. I think as you look at life, also, you know, we we always move up and then we plateau, and mm-hmm. we move up, we plateau. And I've seen the plateaus in my life, um, and I've been yeah. there. I wouldn't say I'm quasi plateauing right now after a really couple of years of really bolstering myself um, up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's always that that self growth and self development. That you know, I want to be. You know, when I leave, when I leave, what you know, what are people going to say? Mm-hmm. You know, that I, you know, I, did I just stay where I was, or right. did I keep developing myself as I went along? What's all the tombstone? What did it say? Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what it say, but it, yeah, hopefully it's good, not bad. So right, right. So uh, top three opportunities that you would say. Uh, I've asked how can we help as a citizenry, but what do you see as for humble? Uh, from your perspective, how you've said personal connection. You know, just get to know people and 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 love on them, hold them accountable, have a relationship. But also, um, what what can we do, or what do you see the three opportunities in? in I don't know if they're economic or in law enforcement. Or what I'll, I'll leave the, the answer to you. What do you what do you what do you see that we have coming up that looks good? Yeah, when I look at Eureka, there's a lot of opportunity in, in Eureka. Eureka has a ton of potential, and I've said that. You know, we have we have our issues. Um, the data shows that. However, we have a ton of potential. Mm-hmm. And so I think for us to reach potential, we have to, a big thing is economy. We have to boost our economy. Yep. We need to bring in businesses, uh, bring in tax oh. bases. I mean, imagine if you lost Costco. Yeah. Right. That'd and be weird. That'd be really weird. Where would you, know, where would you shop at? And that's a huge tax base. What if we got Home Depot? Yeah. <laughs> hold, hold another story. Hold, hold another story, <laughs> right? Um, but we have to boost, bolster our economy. Yeah. Um, and then I think that's a big piece of that. And I think that correlates also the next thing is we look at our policing force. Right now we'll be down, I think in a couple of weeks, we'll be down 10 officers. So we have 48 sworn total Whoa. and we're down to 38. And our staffing is based on a population of 30,000, but the daytime <laughs> we're 60,000. Wow. And so um, our officers here, and again, I'm a guy who goes to meetings. Like I don't, I do nothing flashy. I do police work occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but our patrol guys on the street are really the, guy, really the guys and gals that are busting their rear every day. Uh, they're pushing forward. They run call to call to call nonstop, sometimes for uh, 12 and a half hour shifts. It's long. Uh, long many day. times they don't get breaks. Many times they don't eat lunch, mm-hmm. uh, but they're constantly going. And so I think for us, you know, if we can develop um, our youth, uh, you know, into the next generation of police officers, mm-hmm. that, hey, policing is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very good profession. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's a noble profession. Um, there are obviously standards. We have to always always improve and progress our profession. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is what we need from our, you know, from our community coming up and have our, those local folks that are actually going to be part of the department to actually make the community better. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think the the opportunity we have is if we can keep our kids local, um, you know, we have an academy here, mm-hmm. send them to the academy. We have Cal Poly, we have CR, you know, get an education while you're going to the academy or get an yeah. education. If you want to go straight to empl- work after high school, awesome. Mm-hmm. And go to academy at 21, awesome. And then, you know, when you're, uh, when you're, you know, as an officer, you want to go and finish your bachelor's or your master's or whatever you want to do. That's great, too. Wow. Um, but I think we have a huge opportunity to keep our, our, our local kids and actually develop them into law enforcement. Like that's a major need we, ha- we have right now, major so need. All departments are short, generally speaking? I think everyone except for Fortuna. Um, mm-hmm. Fortuna does a very good job about— uh, Must chief, be a good department to work for. Uh, I think it's a very supportive community for mm-hmm. law enforcement. Um, it's different than—it's definitely much more conservative community. Sure. Um, so I think the, the support for law enforcement is probably a little more significant than mm-hmm. other other areas. We definitely have support in Eureka. Um, sure. But I think it's, it's a smaller community, <laughs> so they have less trouble— uh, getting officers are not, definitely not as busy as we are, mm-hmm. um, but it's just the challenge is, you know, keeping officers here. So example, we boost the economy. It's likely we'll obviously you'll, pr- you'll push your tax base and then mm-hmm. you'll be able to pay officers. Obviously, uh, you'll actually be able to raise their wages, which we're still definitely 
compared to most of the, of the state or underpaid, okay. um, for, especially for the work they do. And you can probably even hire more staff and then also fill the vacancies and specialty mm-hmm. roles like our POP team, mm-hmm. which actually goes out and proactively addresses drug houses and nice. those kind of things. Because right now we're, 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 we don't have the team right now because we don't have the staffing for it. Let's talk about your dispatch team for a second. Sure. Um, I imagine you want to shout out to them because they're usually awesome, right? People that I've met have been really, I mean, even worked with have been really, really amazing. Yeah, the the they're art kind of, of part of the the football team. Oh, they def- yeah, definitely are. Yeah, because they're actually sta- uh, lo- uh, located in our building. Uh, but yeah, they they multitasking extraordinaire. Mm-hmm. They can multitask nonstop, uh, and they also work twelve hour shifts. Wow, uh, sitting down for twelve hours, which is a long time. Um, phones constantly going off. Uh, not only is the mm-hmm. regular the regular non emergency line plus the nine one one line plus radios going on, plus they're running people, plus they're inputting data. Um, it's, it's just, it's craziness for wow. 12 hours. Uh, they get, you know, nights, you know, graveyards will probably get, get an occasional, you know, it might slow down, uh, mm-hmm. knock on wood. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in, in a matter of seconds, like, you know, all chaos can ensue and, and they're doing everything they can. There's only two of them also, uh, wow. in that, in that dispatch center. And so they, they do a lot of amazing things. Are they the core of the 911 calls? Uh, in Eureka, yeah. So okay. any kind of nine one would come. Um, would usually, if you're in Eureka, will go directly to our our center. Yeah, the uh, the gals that I, the well guys too that I've talked to have been amazing. So uh, what can we do? We can we can support the economy. We can raise up some amazing kids and be supportive of kids. And what was the other thing you said? Mentorship. Mentorship, and then um, and then go one to one on people with people and engage people and be. I guess somebody told me, hey, just be a friend. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, it, I think once you know people, it breaks down, ba- you know, barriers. You look at somebody, obviously, we, you know, we're, we're, we're naturally judging people regardless of wh- whether we recognize it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but just having those connections, you know, you know, it's just amazing how I'll, you know, walk down the street and people are amazed, like the homeless will talk to me because you know, they're like, well, why would the homeless want to practically talk to the cops? Right. Well, it's because I know them and we're, you know, we have a relationship, we have a friendship. Sure. Um, obviously, you know, I'm an officer. So, you know, there's an expectation that they have to follow the rules. Um, you know, we've seen even, you know, regular citizens, whatever, reg, whatever regular and normal is. I don't, I don't know if that is, but right, typical. You know, typical. People, you know, people yelling at us, that, you know, for whatever, are just being mm-hmm. nasty to an officer, and we'll have homeless people come up and say, "Hey, time out. You need to back yeah. off because this is, it's, it's great. which is very bizarre, right? Because you think it's perfect. Be the other way around, um, but it's not. So it's an interesting dynamic. I love it. No, it's true. So, I, um, I have a story about that. It was uh, a bunch of us were on the Arcata Plaza singing some praise songs. This is thirty years ago. And uh, a homeless guy started to come up and yell at all the, these youth that were singing. And the other homeless guy came up to our defense and said, get out of here. This is not, who, you, did, this isn't your plaza. Would you please, you know, stand down and go, go sit? And the guy did. And so, and so it should be. And I imagine a homeless population could be a really big resource for a bad, a bad apple that shows up in some fashion. And, hey, yeah, he's right there. He's sitting over by right there. Yeah, we've solved a lot of crimes, um, in major crimes, just the fact that we, we have a major incident in Old Town, mm-hmm. and usually just the, the people we know uh, or the connections we have, people say, hey, you may want to talk to so-and-so, or hey, mm-hmm. uh, here's the name. Mm-hmm. And uh, just because those the folks that we, I mean, we're, we're there to protect our homeless, our homeless community also, and mm-hmm. they know that we care about them. We know that we see value in them, sure. um, even though sometimes their behavior is unacceptable and we address it. Um, but that relationship allows allows them to give us information because they want to stay safe as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very interesting dynamic, which some people don't don't believe it until they actually come out with the team and say, "Wow, this is this is really interesting how yeah. this how this works." No, so, so everybody's got a story and on a journey. That's what we say at our house. So um, I'm going to part with two questions for you. Should have started with these. These. So my father in law Tom was a marathon runner and a really nice guy and from LA, and he he had two questions for people. Who are you? What do you want? So we'll start with the, the who are you, uh, Leonard? Besides the, the data of who you are, who who are you? That's a that's a that's a good question. Uh, you know, when I, I actually did a, 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 a kind of a value system assessment of myself years ago, and one of the things that came up is uh, I'm a person of integrity. Um, I am who I am, and pretty much what you see is what you get. Nice. However, having integrity also. Uh, forces you to continue developing yourself. Mm. And so that's what I always start with. Um, but, you know, besides being, you know, an, uh, working as a, a police commander or a police officer, you know, I'm also, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent of two two young children, nine and seven-year-olds. Uh, I'm wow. a husband. 
mm-hmm. um, which, you know, marriages and law enforcement are, are can be definitely difficult. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I'm blessed to have a, a, a spouse that um, handles, she's my personal assistant. That's what she calls herself. Nice. Um, she can, calls you LaFrance? Yeah, she does, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Just, I yeah. can imagine Jody going, hey, Hammond. Yep. What? Yes, dear. What? Yep, happened. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. Cool. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I'm a, uh, you know, that's, that's my family aspect, but I'm a huge uh, board game player. Wow. I, uh, I'm big into sports simulation board games based on all data. Um, I love data. I love sports simulation and board games. What does that look like? Not it Monopoly. Lo- no, it looks like, uh, like you have a, you have a game system. Like right now I'm playing a, a game called history maker baseball by play P L L P L A A Y.com mm-hmm. or play games. Um, and it's a, you have a booklet, you have uh, cards. I, I play a fictional league and you have, huh. Different players. I actually created the league myself and been playing it for three seasons now. And wow. um, you roll it's, dice. You look at the book. So it's not online. It's not nope. on a computer. Nope. It's all you roll dice and you keep scorebooks. And that's cool. Um, and I love data. So I'm a I'm a data guy. So I love knowing my batting average. My player is you know right. a, you know three thirty two or you know and then uh, it's just kind of my own little realm. I, I I'm a I'm you a. You said you like documentaries. So you like Ken Burns baseball. I do. Yep. Although he got Classic. it wrong. Did he? He got it wrong. He got it wrong about Ty Cobb apparently. So. That Ty um, Cobb was not a monster. He was not a monster. No, nope. apparently he was not, according to most the most recent. Uh, Interesting, because it, it always comes out that he's a, he's a real. Yeah, apparently he was not. So. Eric. Yeah, but yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a, I'm a kind of a closet geek, and um, but that's cool. For the Baseball. most part, I'm a homebody, and um, when I'm not at work tr- tapping to my extroversion side, I'm usually at home tapping to my introversion side. Called adapted be- work behavior. It is yeah. out of you know out of necessity. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's I think who. It's quasi who I am, I guess. Okay. But what you see is what you get. I love it, man. That's that. That's solid. Uh, so, what what is it that you want? I talked about a little bit about legacy. What What do you want for? Uh, what do you want? What do you want from life? Remember the old? It was an old rock and roll, the Tubes or somebody. That's that's also another deep question. Um, what I want in life? Well, I'd like to, you know, obviously, uh, when I'm done with this career, uh, I can be done at fifty, so about six years. I can be in theory, I can be done. I probably won't wow. be, but. Uh, you know, what I want after that is to obviously to keep, um, moving my family forward, uh, hopefully get, you know, have my, my kids, if they want to, whatever they want to do in life next, either go to college or, uh, get employed, support that obviously. But if they do mm-hmm. want to go to school, uh, find a way to pay for that as well. Um, I was blessed to, you know, end up with my master's degree la- a couple years ago. Nice. Where? Um, uh, I did it online through, uh, Union Institute University, um, which what, is a, what's your degree in, um, uh, organizational leadership. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I want to support the education. I think it's important. It's not everything. Not mm-hmm. everyone needs a master's degree. Um, sure. But for me, you know, that's what I want to do. And it made me feel feel better and helps me to work. And it's awesome. Um, for me, though. You uh, said integrity is always growing. It is always growing. Yeah. 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 You know, and uh, after I, uh, you know, after retirement, I'd like to, you know, either teach at a university um, or uh, consult on the side, which I do some now, uh, mm-hmm. for example, with like the regional center. Yeah. Um, so, you know, consult about, you know, crisis intervention, uh, working with people with disabilities, uh, mental mm-hmm. health, uh, you know, anything in that, that realm, uh, policing the homeless, how do we police the homeless? Mm-hmm. Um, so any kind of consulting work on that and also teaching in that realm as well. So I love it. That's awesome. Um, any questions for me? I don't think so. No. Wait. Well, you could be the interviewer. I know. Um, no, I really appreciate having you. Um, and I, I share your heart for um, special needs populations because they're they're everywhere. And uh, my oldest son, Jacob, who's a great guy and programmer, he goes, hey, Dad, nine kids plus me, I'm 10. He goes, I think we're all special needs, don't you? And I go, yeah, Jacob, I'm pretty sure we are. And that's so, okay. So, And that's Okay. Anyway, hey, uh, appreciate you having you, and uh, uh, come back sometime. And uh, uh, we want to support what you guys are doing all the time at EPD, but also with regard to Regional Center and those that kind of program. So appreciate you. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, have a great day.